Good morning, everyone. Just going to give people a few seconds to trickle in here, connect to audio, and then we'll get started right away. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Welcome to our second annual Field Inclusive Week. We are excited for you to meet our panelists momentarily. My name is Murray Burgess. I use she, her pronouns, and I am an assistant professor in the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Aquaculture at Mississippi State University. I am also the co-founder and CEO of Field Inclusive a young nonprofit working towards amplifying and supporting marginalized and historically excluded biologists and researchers who professionally work outdoors. Just so you are aware, today's webinar will be recorded and recordings will be posted to our YouTube channel throughout the week. So be sure to follow us there for easy access to these recordings later. Shortly, I will introduce our panelists, but first I would like to give a special thanks to the sponsor of Field Inclusive Week 2024, The Nature Conservancy. Thank you so much for coming on board as our sponsor for the second year in a row and for being dedicated to promoting and supporting a more inclusive outdoors. It's through organizations like yours and the many individuals who donate to support Field Inclusive's mission that we can continue our goals in raising awareness when it comes to social field safety issues by hosting events like Field Inclusive Week, as well as providing financial support to marginalized and historically excluded individuals who professionally work outdoors. So now without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you to today's uh, panelists. Um, panelists, as I introduce each one of you, please feel free to turn on your cameras. So first up is Michaela Brister. Michaela is a Mississippi native and graduate of Mississippi State University. She received a bachelor's degree in wildlife, fisheries, and aquaculture, and a bachelor's in environmental economics and management in 2019. In 2021, she received a master's in wildlife, fisheries, and aquaculture. Michaela is an associate wildlife biologist and currently works at the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation in the position of manager, federal relations on the government relations, external affairs team. Michaela has prior experience working at the U.S. Forest Service and Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. In 2020, Michaela co-founded Culture and Conservation, LLC, a social media and podcast platform that seeks to educate the public on ways in which conservation and culture intersect. Lee Bergassa is a 20-year veteran of Raleigh Parks with a focus on horticulture and natural resource conservation efforts. A certified arbor arborist, licensed public pesticide applicator, certified plant professional, and long time, uh, long and lifelong Raleigh resident, she spent 10 years as a gardener for public gardens, including destination parks, downtown streetscapes, and popular wedding venues and years as an invasive species program coordinator and three years with urban forestry. And last but not least, we welcome Abby Tempe. Abby graduated from Michigan State University in 2019 with a bachelor's in zoology and a bachelor's in fisheries and wildlife. She has worked with spotted hyenas, black bears, wolves, white-tailed deer, feral pigs, bobcats, and urban wildlife and has spent time working as a wildlife specialist in California, focusing on wildlife damage mitigation and techniques with USDA Wildlife Services. Abby is broadly interested in the ecology, behavior, and management of carnivores, with special interest in human-wildlife interactions, population ecology, foraging ecology, and predator-prey relationships. Abby's research focuses on coyote ecology and livestock management throughout the state of Ohio. So a huge welcome and special thanks to all of our panelists today and for agreeing to share their time and experience with our audience members. So audience, please feel free to submit questions for our panelists for the Q&A portion, which will be the second half of our discussion today. Now, without much more, we'll begin our panel discussion on STEM field safety. And I would like to start with just asking all of the panelists to briefly describe their background, dive a little bit more into how they got into the positions that they're in and why they love what they do. 
So we'll go in the order I've introduced you, Michaela, then Lee, then Abby. Lucky first. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, so as Murray mentioned, I received uh, my bachelor's and master's from Mississippi State University in wildlife fisheries and aquaculture. And my graduate research centered around Bob White quail. And that is during that time is where the majority of my fieldwork experience came from. Um, my prior experience with the Mississippi State um, Department of uh, Fisheries and wildlife, uh, that was an internship. So a lot of that field experience always had a buddy. But once I got to grad school, that's when you're kind of on your own. And um, so I'll be speaking from that experience today, um, just kind of like the different things I encountered um, and things that I learned as far as like how to keep myself safe. Um, but as Mary Mitch also mentioned, I uh, work in a conservation nonprofit now, so I'm no longer in the field, but I am able to use those experiences when talking with federal partners or um, different people in uh, various aspects of the government Government when it comes to decision making. So uh, all of that experience was super helpful and uh, very useful to what I'm doing now. So, um... I've worked my entire career in urban settings, um, whether that be urban forests or urban streetscapes, streetscapes, um, and I've worked pretty much alone <laughs> um, for 20 plus years out in the field um, and have encountered some very interesting urban situations. <laughs> um, so I'll be speaking from that perspective. Hi all. Um, yeah, I'm Abby, as Marie was talking about. Um, I come from uh, the Mitten State up in Michigan and I mostly have worked, uh, I started really in the wildlife field, um, working with spotted hyenas and working the uh, Mara Hyena Project that is through that was through Michigan State. And my first field job, I remember um, being given a map and a GPS and told to just to go out into the woods and figure out how to do, just figure out how to be in the woods. Um, and I didn't know if I would make it. Um, I think that was probably one of my first experiences that I was like, okay, um, I was with a buddy, but we kind of went off our separate, separate ways. Uh, so she can do one, it was um, hair, like hair pellet surveys. And she went to the other side, did one. And then I was just by myself trying to figure out where this point was. Uh, and that was probably one of the first times I was like, okay, I, I got to figure out how to navigate being outside by myself. And um, not, I fall a lot in the field. So uh, I had to figure out how to be safe in the like physical aspect. Um, but I've worked in a lot of rural environments where you come across a lot of different types of people that have different viewpoints of as you and also trying to like figure out safety in that aspect when it comes to different um, cultural things that you kind of come across. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about that too. Thank you. And you all already began to allude somewhat to my first question for the group, which is what are some of the safety concerns that you initially faced in the field? Um, I just kind of want to piggyback off what Abby was saying about working in rural settings. So since my uh, research focused or centered um, Bob White quail, I was in the rural settings a lot. And we we did have a buddy system uh we're you know all lab mates and everything but you still have to go out on your own and figure out how to be on your own and then navigate that so i mean i'm working in the middle of nowhere at mississippi the majority of the time and um that comes with its own you know kind of i don't know the word i'm looking for but you, there's always that underlying like you don't know who you're going to run into so there so when I first started grad school, our professors sat all of us down in our lab just to talk about um, the, di the different uh, properties that we would be going to uh, visit and work on. And the main property that we worked on was one that the university had a, a relationship with and good relationship with the landowner. The landowner was great. However, there was one of the landowner's neighbors who hated that landowner and also hated the university and would make it her mission 
to run off anybody she saw that was in a university vehicle um, trying to work on the landowner's property. And so as the professor was telling us that story, I'm like, okay, well, obviously she's just a hateful person, generally speaking, it sounds like. But if she feels this way about, you know, white people and people who look like her, I can only imagine how she's going to feel if she sees me. So I did make it a point to tell my professor, like, okay, where exactly does this woman live? Can you just make sure I don't visit points near her site? And he was like, sure, we can work that out. Um, but yeah, that was kind of the my first deep dive and like being by myself in the field and having to really be more so worried about the um, ill-intentioned strangers more so than the landowners, because as Abby kind of mentioned, the landowners or that you might run into, they have their own perspectives about things. But when you're running into the strangers who don't even have a relationship with uh, whatever organization you're working for, it can be even more, uh, you know, just scary, honestly. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things that um, I always ran into is an, on approaching any site, I think it's the same thing as that awareness of who's around you, what what is happening. You know, our our public parks are open 24-7. We can't close them. Um, and we deliberately invite the public in, and the public includes everybody. <laughs> and they all have their own ideas about what they're going to do with their time in our public spaces. Um, so there are what I've come to refer to as untaxed businesses, um, drug deals happening all the time <laughs> in our parks. Um, there are, you know, sex workers. There, there's all kinds of things happening in our public parks, and it's it, whether you're on a UTV or a truck or walking, just having that awareness of who's around you, what's around you, um, and where your escape routes are has always been a pretty important thing for me. Yeah, I think one of the first safety concerns that I came across um, was it was 2020. So it was like the summer I was uh, fortunate enough to get a job working with uh, a white-tailed deer project, camera trapping project up in Michigan. And uh, I was, we had to drive in separate cars, but I was with another tech and he was a male. Um, and he was driving before me, but we were door knocking to put camera traps on people's property for um, this white tailed deer project. And one place that we went, the gate was open. And usually what we say, if like a gate's open, you can drive in. And so we went there and uh, a woman came out with a shotgun um, and it was terrifying. Um, thankfully, I did have somebody with me, but we were like, okay, we just got to back up slowly and just like be like, okay, we're not here do anything we did have michigan state on our vehicles but that did she was not it was not happening she hated the dnr she hated michigan state she was like this is not um not really her thing so um and then we told our supervisors and they were very like oh are you okay like are you, like are you fine um and i think that was my first encounter i'm like okay well these are the kind this is what we're going to run into when you work in um rural settings and so when i worked in rural california um I worked with some people that uh, said a lot of stuff about women um, that weren't very good. And a lot of the times that I was in that place, I'm like, okay, I can't, I was scared to, sit, to stand up because I was the only female and they were all older in their 60s, uh, white, man, white men that were very much had the far, far right opinions that um, about women. And so, and I felt at some point like danger and I'm like, okay, yeah, I got to be aware and I've just got to kind of get out of this situation as best as I can. Or if I was stuck in a car with them, I'm like, I got to be silent because if I try to speak up, they're going to say some stuff that's going to be really bad and it could end up being pretty dangerous for me. Um, so I think a lot of it is being aware and being able to like know when to not kind of push more when you're with those kinds of people. Um, that's kind of my, my experience with some problems that I've run into as a woman in STEM. Yeah. And um, I know Michaela mentioned that she was able to talk to her advisor and get a bit of a different strategy going for her. Was anyone else able to talk to a supervisor or PI to kind of accommodate or address the safety concerns that she had? 
honestly, I feel like I was just expected to do the work and, and not, not react. Um, I'm sure everybody on this panel can agree. We're, we're working in a primarily male field. Um, and the expectation for me to excel in my job, in my profession, my career, was that I could do everything that they could do and that I could do it in the same environment that they did. And if I, if I showed fear, if I expressed concerns, that I would be thought of as less than. So not, not a lot of support. I found that, I mean, my first tech job that was on, um, I worked for uh, graduate students and they were very much like, if you are, don't feel safe when you're out in the field, um, please let us know, like whether it's physical safety or you come across anyone. Um, they also had us carry bear spray, not just for the bears. Um, I'm a big, I'm a big component of like, I like really think that it's a good idea to have bear spray um, or pepper spray, no matter where you're at in the city versus rural anywhere, um, even in areas where there's not bears. Um, because I think that if something happens in like the last resort, you might have to use it. Um, and so I kind of been big on that. Uh, the supervisor working for wildlife services, I was the first female they ever hired in the Northern, um, the Northern district, basically the Northern part of uh, California. And it was, it was it was tough. Um, a lot of my a lot of my views and like a lot of my concerns weren't heard, and so I was like, okay, well, I I'm just gonna have to sit this back, and I wasn't allowed. Well, allowed. Um, my coworker did not let me really work on the projects that I wanted to work on. Um, because he felt that because he was older and had more experience, that he was the one that should do this, and because I've never really because working with wildlife services, you have to work with firearms a lot. And so uh, he didn't think that I had enough experience to even try to use it and to like gain that um, confidence uh, doing those. So it, that, that job I had to navigate being like, okay, also I don't have the support. I have to, I have to try to just like be confident in myself and just kind of navigate this so I can get out of these, uh, some of these situations. Yeah, and, and that's really unfortunate that you have to like struggle to even speak up for yourself. Um, and I also carry pepper spray and a knife with me all the time when I'm outside, which leads me to my next question is, so after you um, experienced these safety issues, what were you able to do for yourself, whether it be carrying some of those tools or did you find other resources? I also would like to add that I got myself a pocket knife after realizing I'm going to be in the woods in the middle of nowhere, most of the time in the dark because we were doing the surveys uh, right before sunset. So I am also an advocate, get you pepper spray, bear spray, a pocket knife, whatever you need. Um, if you do feel like you might have to resort to that. But I also would make it a point while I was going with my lab mates, we were traveling there together. We were still separating. So obviously they knew where I was going to be. But the day before I would leave, I would always let a friend a friend or a family member know like, hey, I'm going to be out in the field in the morning. You have my location. Just keep up with it. And if you haven't heard from me for a while, you know, obviously like check in. So I think sharing your location is uh, definitely very important. And a lot of the times if I felt like I was unsafe, I would call someone just to kind of like talk with them um, and or just stay on the phone, honestly, because like I said, I'm I'm walking through the woods in the middle of the night. I never knew fog was scary or thought that it was scary until I was out there by myself. And there's like all these tall grasses. I'm like, if somebody's coming at me, I literally, I won't see them until they're right here. So I would just call someone on the phone and say, hey, just stay on the phone with me until I can like see a little better out here. And then you can hang up and I'll feel good about what's going on. So for me, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say I'm probably the oldest person on this panel. <laughs> so uh, when I started, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have, you know, those kinds of options. But what we did have as a municipality was a police department 
And I made friends with and spoke with a lot of the officers that were in my areas of responsibility um, and kind of like, you know, hey, what's your patrol cycle like? You know, I'm going to sort of plan my cycles sort of around their, um, their schedules. And I also, as sort of a happy accident, um, was gifted a Hori Hori knife, which is a soil knife. It's about uh, six, seven inches long. Um, and it looks very daunting. It's actually really a dibble tool for, you know, planting small, um, small <laughs> containerized material. But um, when you stick it in your back pocket and you've got seven inches of blade coming out of your back pocket, um, people are less likely to approach you. Um, so I, I ended up with a weapon sort of accidentally, um, but always felt very confident that at least on the outside, I would appear to be daunting. Um, even though, you know, my five foot fourness is not that scary. <laughs> I love that it's all about just looking scary and being confident because then people will like kind of stay away. So yeah, that's, that's cool. Yeah. Just the projection of confidence, even if it's not real. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, now that in my master's, I work primarily with another uh, woman and we are um, mostly working with people. So we go to, um, you know, learning how to interact with the hunting and trapping community has been um, absolutely one of the uh, best things I think that I have ever learned and being able to communicate with them and like build these friendships so that they tell other people that we might be coming to their land or we're going to be doing this, you know? Um, but yeah, like I said, bear spray, um, I started lifting just to be stronger. Um, that's kind of, kind of really a weird thing to say but like I w want to be strong so in case something does happen I can like defend for myself um and I'm also very big on like uh, yeah communicating being on the phone with people uh letting them know and being able to read a map um because sometimes things die you're in the rural areas you don't know what's going to happen um understanding where your coordinate directions are and trying to make sure you know how to get out if you're out like in the middle of nowhere um, just kind of hiking through the woods because I've had situations where I kind of got lost, especially in my first field job, but being able to read a map and also being able to use a GPS and having a ton of batteries on you uh, for that GPS is so important because the times that I've gotten lost and been like, okay, well, this is, this is fun. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you all are here today to speak on your experience. <laughs> Uh, which leads me to, so you were able to get these personal protection measures in place. So what do you wish that the institution or department that you were in had already had in place for you so that you wouldn't have had to do so much on your own? Um, I would say, like in a university setting, especially for the grad students who are going to be going out alone, it would be helpful for the department itself just to put on safety training like events or courses. I mean, because you talk about them in the science courses that you're taking, or if your uh, class has a lab component, field safety is usually brought up, but mostly as I don't want to say an afterthought, but it can kind of feel like an afterthought when it's brought up. But just having events that are totally dedicated to y'all are our students we're going to teach you how to be safe in the field how to feel safe in the field I think that would be would have been very helpful instead of having to kind of like I guess learn as I go I I personally wish that um my organization had had other women just in general <laughs> um when when I came on board there were two other women out of the 300 member staff um, so like just not even the understanding or the thought, um, of what women might need, um, in particular, and I'm going to try to say this delicately, um, but easy access to bathroom facilities, um, for those certain times, uh, you know, a lot of our parks and facilities don't have public restrooms and we are not encouraged to go into private um, businesses when we're in uniform. Uh, 
I have found myself in some very interesting places trying to take care of just my body's needs, um, <laughs> which could, you know, put me in a very vulnerable situation in an isolated area. Um, but then also a little bit more of a will help and support attitude for all employees, as opposed to we expect you to produce and provide 110% at all times and that's the expectation, so suck it up. Um, so a little bit more inclusive attitude and a little bit more more of a partnership and collaborate, collaboration as opposed to you as the individual go and do these things. We're, we're still working on it. Um, yeah, Lee, I, I just want to agree with you on the whole, like the individualistic mentality. I Like even in just in school, you can kind of see from the, you know, older professors where that's the traditional train of thought, but like people are in the field and need to feel safe. So collaborating is important. And then also the bathroom thing. Yes, that was also never really thought about it as much until um, I was out there by myself a lot. But that is key. And no one ever thinks about that. Yeah, I think um, working for what we consider a boys club was probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to do when I was out working with wildlife services. Um, mostly because there needed to probably be some cultural sensitivity training. Um, there was a lot of misogynistic and kind of violent things that I've heard from um, my male counterparts. And those are really scary because I can't do anything in that moment when you're the only female. You're like, well, I can't really say anything. So I just have to like kind of chuckle this off and be like, oh, well, this happened. Okay, this is not good. Um, and it makes it and I already have anxiety as it is so it makes the anxiety heighten um and you're just like okay well now I have to like kind of put on this um you know how am I going to get out of this situation and how I'm going to just like make sure I'm safe and don't say anything that they're going to like continue on with the what they consider boy talk or um whatever that might be so that was like one of the probably scarier stuff I think that a lot of these organizations and governments and um, universities, I think sensitivity training, um, also having opportunities for, you know, uh, field safety training in general, wilderness uh, safety training. Um, and yeah, also, like I said, sensitivity training, but being able to talk about menstrual cycles out, it, like just in general, like you need to be, we're women, like those who have um, periods need to be able to talk about it and being like, okay, um, especially if you're not feeling good at that time of month, people have endo endochemosis. I can't say the word very well, but they have um, different, you know, problems that could impact how we are in the field because we, our body physically can't do it. Um, so it's, I think we need a lot more training in when it comes to women, women of color um, on how to like, just be sensitive to the things that we need. Um, that's my, that's really my big takeaway and all of it. Totally agree. And um, I know we were just touching on it, so I'll segue into this. Do you think that there's any other special safety concerns or challenges that women, especially women with intersectional identities face in the field that maybe their male counterparts might not have to even think about? Um, well, I feel like everybody's kind of already hit on it a little bit, like Lee with the bathroom thing, because I mean, you're in a vulnerable, vulnerable position. It's not just like about, oh, I, I need, you know, prim and proper restroom or whatever. No, like this is a potential safety concern. This this is not me being, you know, whatever. Um, and then like in rural communities, I mean, Obviously, I'm black, so I'm just always concerned about anybody I might run into because I don't know their personal beliefs or backgrounds. And a lot of times it's too late to find out because, as Abby mentioned earlier, um, the I, was it a landowner that came out with a shotgun? That was that's literally the exact scenario that I was afraid of right there. Um, so just being aware that people might have those concerns and being able to willing to talk to them about it like what are the strategies that we can figure out um to make sure you feel safe because as both Abby and Lee have said already 
you kind of fear bringing up things sometimes because you don't want to be seen as weak or you don't want to be seen as like not capable. But towards the end of grad school, I did kind of address some of my concerns with my advisor and his whole thing was like, well, why didn't you tell me sooner? I would have would have made sure you felt more comfortable. And I was like, yeah, I know. I, I believe that and I trust that. But I also just didn't want to be seen as weak or not being able to perform the job. Um, so, yeah, that's what I would have to say on that. Yeah, and I um, I agree that uh, with Abby on the sensitivity training, um, but it, it really is simply just the presence of others, right? So getting outside of just the white male, like let's get some, let's change some hiring practices. Let's get women, let's get minorities, let's get like everybody, let's have everybody in here so that we're normalizing it, right? Like women shouldn't be considered a different thing. You know, like we're, we're also human as it happens. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> Um, maybe I'm not as strong, but perhaps I'm more creative in my approach to solving the problem in front of me. Like maybe I don't need to throw brute force at it. Um, maybe my slightly smaller chainsaw will get through the tree eventually, maybe not as quickly, but it'll still go and I can run it all day. I just can't, you know, throw a 24 inch bar out there all day. Um, so it's, it's the, the appreciation it's, it's having people, including everyone, so that it's not a strange thing. It's not an unusual thing to say, oh, there's there's a woman doing physical labor. Look at that. Ooh, shocking. Take a picture. You know, like, no, that's that's okay. Look, there's there's 12 of them, you know. Um, I think that's for me the biggest thing. And and I think a lot of that is giving others the opportunity. So I see a lot in hiring practices over the years where interviews go through and the perception of certain groups is different. Like, I don't think that person would fit in, I hear from a lot of hiring authorities. And I'm like, but do you know, like, have you tried? Yeah, um, I don't know, there's, it's, I think that my biggest um, concern is that I think we kind of have to start at the, like, to get more people into this field, start at like a high school level and talk to, you know, these girls, women of color, any other minorities that, you know, to come into this field, we have to bring them in. And I think because they aren't, I'm still seeing, I mean, I see a lot more women in my program um, I love that as I was going through undergrad and now in grad school, I'm seeing a lot more, but once I get out into the field, that's a little bit more like when I started working, I'm still just seeing white men out there. And it's not a terrible thing, but it's not a thing where it's like, I don't like, I have this thing, pure anxiety of being like, well, I can't really connect that well with these, some of these older men that have way different opinions, especially when I want to work in rural settings. Um. I think that we need to start at a high school level working with students that are, you know, excited. They want to be involved. Um, I love working with high school girls because they are so excited about learning about carnivores and, you know, learning about wildlife, especially if they're in urban settings. They're like, oh, I saw a coyote. I saw a raccoon the other day. Um, I'm sorry if you hear squeaking in the background. That is my dog. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, and I think that starting there is really important and just being able to like talk with your supervisors um, and just having more training. I actually was looking up online yesterday, Ohio State has, um, with our School of Environment and Natural Resources, they have a whole page on how to be safe in the field and different trainings to do. And I didn't realize that that was a thing. And I think we need to also be putting that out there to classes um, and having just more trainings, um, I think will be just beneficial overall. Have you been able to find any of types of those trainings or workshops or just safe spaces, safe spaces in general for women in the field? Um, I haven't 
personally seen, I guess, a whole lot of resources dedicated specifically, one to just safety, generally speaking for everybody, but especially for um, women in the field. Um, so it's still kind of like, we're at a point where we're still just having to advocate for ourselves. So for me, I feel like I I was just, I felt really blessed, honestly, to be in an organization where I could identify somebody that I trusted and express concerns if I, I really didn't feel safe or comfortable about something and have them actually listen to what I was saying and try to think of creative ways to help me feel safe and not just, you know, kind of brush it off or whatever. Um, so it just goes back to, I guess, like the sensitivity training. Um, and every organization is not doing that, but like there are individuals who might be in that organization who just personally that is their um, personality so you just kind of have to find I guess like identify uh, whoever you trust and go about it um, that way honestly so we kind of had to it wasn't an organizational effort but with those other two women when I started they acted as mentors for me and and having that mentorship and, and their knowledge and their experience um, and their friendship uh, was very, very important. And, and we sort of started creating our own tools. Um, so the uniforms, for example, that were offered, um, that we are still offered <laughs> 20 plus years in, um, are not for women. Uh, so even our safety vests don't fit. They're like, I mean, I can belt it, wear it as a dress. Um, so, you know, when when we look for even the simplest, if, if you just want to talk PPE, like it's it's amazing. And it, it's come a long way. You know, now there's like Safety Girl and all these other companies, but there haven't always been. So, I mean, like that's, that's a plus now. Um, but even as recently as two years ago, we were sharing websites where you could buy work pants for women. You know, like that's just not even, it's still not widely available. And we have to like, oh, look, I found, I found this. And everybody's like, ah, and now we're all wearing the same pants because we, somebody dug through the internet long enough to find the, you know, the perfect cargo pant for women, you know, um, or chaps or whatever. There, there's all kinds of things out there. Um, I wear a size five shoe, um, which is not, a, you know, basically it's like stride ride size. Um, and they don't really make that many steel toe in five, in a size five. Um, I have yet to find a pair of waders that fits me, you know, <laughs> like um, because the children's waders have the right size shoe, but they're too short. You know, it just, it's, it's things like that. Um, and those, I guess, self-produced resources that we, we share amongst each other. It's the networking. I think that's really the safety net. Yeah, I have to piggyback on that. I don't think there's any training that I've noticed at the institution level, whether it's with an organization or, um, with the university, uh, even when I was in um, at Michigan State, there's just nothing that I remember. It's more of like who I follow on Twitter, who I in, like go on Instagram. And um, Gail Sanchez, I'm going to give her a little bit of a shout out because she has um, her Instagram. She talks a lot about different resources that um, for I'm a I'm a female that's shorter and I'm on the bigger side. So I nothing fits me. I have to wear men's clothes. Um, and then they're too long because I'm only five foot. So whether, even though that I'm on the bigger side, but I'm still female, I'm short, I can't, I have to roll up my pants um, and, or get them hemmed. And then that costs more money, or it's just um, working with the women that I am so lucky to the mentors that I have had um, through my time so far as in the field. And I would not be where I'm at without them, whether they were other graduate students, um, they have helped me in whatever ways possible. I think we uh, we do need more training, but it is I think we are very fortunate to have um, mentorship that we can seek out. But we have to seek that out, right? So we have to be the ones to be like, hey, 
um, I like what you do and you seem cool. Can you like help me navigate this field? Um, I'm looking for clothes that like might fit me. I'm looking for like safety measures. I don't know how to go about this. And even some of my like male mentors, they don't know how to handle some of this stuff, especially when we talk about menstruation. Um, so you do have to, you know, go and seek these out. And a lot, some people are, you know, timid and, and very like introverted and they don't feel like they can go out and get that. So I think like building programs where we have women, women of color, um, uh, trans women, and just having that there, creating these workshops ourselves, I think is the way that we're going to go um, and what we're going to have to do and then push our institutions to adopt these programs and workshops. And I just want to say, this is why I love what Build Inclusive is doing, honestly, because, I mean, we've all said it. We, we didn't see those resources. We had to seek it out ourselves and find support networks. And y'all are building support networks and providing resources for people. So I really love this. I just wanted to make sure I say that before we end. Uh, thank you for that. And so we've got a lot of questions in the chat. So I'm going to open the Q&A and try to get to as many of these as we can. So the first question is, what advice do you have for people when advocating for their safety needs with professors, supervisors, coworkers, et cetera? Have you ever experienced pushback against your comments or concerns? I I have experienced pushback, but kind of like in a roundabout way. Um, so I don't think the person thought they were pushing back, um, if, I, if I'm being honest. But it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, finding individuals in that organization where you trust that what you say will be heard so that they can go to bat for you with whoever they might need to. Um, that that has really kind of worked for me. Yeah, and I I, I I agree with Michaela. It's it's one of those things where you have to pick the right person to bring the concerns and and know where you're going to get the most effective communication with with a person um, that can do something or help you in some way. Yeah, I think um, just having another, like confiding in a friend that can also help you uh, navigate how to talk to people that could give you pushback. Um, that's helped me a lot. And some of the pushback that I've had, I'm like, okay, how do we, you know, talk about this conflict or whatever it might be um, in a, manner that's not too emotional so I know that like we we talk about women being emotional that's just like a trope that we have but um trying to word things in a way where you're like okay this is how I feel this is not like I'm not putting this on you um we're, we're just learning to communicate and I think has been the best for me when it comes to pushback I'm still working on it I think that's just it's just a work in progress when it comes to that uh, thank you for sharing. And thank you, Stephanie and Carice in the chat for sharing your experiences too. The next question, uh, this person says, this is a great opportunity for those of us tuning in from Mecklenburg County Water Quality. Thank you guys for joining. Um, awareness is definitely key. If you are not feeling safe approaching the situation, how have you balanced that with performing your call of duty? And is there anything you've done to advocate for yourselves to managers in those situations? I will say, um, if I've ever felt like wholly like unsafe, like I feel like if I'm going to go in this place and it's not going to be good, I'm just not going to do it. I know that's not, I guess, popular, but I'm just not willing to put myself at risk. And it can be seen as conflict. And I know everybody's like, doesn't like conflict, but if if you if it's really a matter of safety, you just have to be willing to kind of push back and say, "Hey, I genuinely do not feel safe in this situation," um, and just kind of have to deal with the fallout, I guess, as it comes. Which I mean, it's not ideal, but yeah, yeah. I've I've left sites before. Just I'll just leave. You know, I mean, if there's if there's not a way to be safe, and there's I, I've been in some really sketchy situations, um, but if it's if there's no way for me to be safe, I'm I'm all I've got at the end of the day. Exactly. You know, I'll find another job. 
but <laughs> exactly that's how I feel. <laughs> but I don't want to go through you know physical or emotional trauma to the point where I can't function um it's it's not worth it and and if anybody if anybody in my organization has a problem with that I'm more than happy to talk to HR yeah, I I think learning to say no, <laughs> like the biggest, just like being and being confident in that. Um, I'm a very like outward person. And I think like after my first ever field season, when I pushed myself in limits that like, I got a little bit physically hurt in some of them because I was out. I'm like, okay, I have to do this. Like I have to show that I can do this. Um, I just am like, I'm, I'm not, I, I can't do that again. Um, I think there was, again um probably the job when I had in Northern California was probably the most like made me most aware about me being a woman in this field I think um I definitely was had to say no to some uh land that I did not want to go on some landowners um I was like I don't feel safe when it comes to who this person is um I don't think that they're going to treat me with respect and they're uh to me they were pretty dangerous um and so I was like, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to go. I'm just, just not going to do it. And so just being able to find that confidence and being like, okay, in the no, using that word, I think is really important. Absolutely. And along those same lines, we have two questions that are kind of similar. So I'm going to combine them together. So how do you support your own mental health when encountering these dangerous situations? like direct threats to your physical safety, all these casual verbal and microaggressions, racist landowners, navigating, traveling by yourself. It's upsetting to always have your knowledge and presence questioned. So how do you keep going? Um, for me personally, it comes back to support networks, really having people, family, friends, whoever you can identify around you who are at the end of the day, they're going to listen to you vent your frustrations because there's not always a solution to everything. I, I hate that, but sometimes you're just going to have to deal with it. But having people like a support net network around you um, so that way you're not internalizing everything and just feeling heavy all the time is helpful. Yeah, I have a therapist. Uh, but uh, no, also, yeah, your friends, your, you know, the colleagues that you trust. Um, also, I've kind of built for myself um, a confidence that's, I, I think it's real at this point, um, because I exuded it for so long that now it's, it's sort of baked into me. Um, and I can look back on a lot of the things that I've done and have gone through and experienced and say, you know, oh, okay, like, I've got this, I've, I've got this, I'm going to be okay, I'm going to be fine. Um, I deal in this current role as an inspector with a lot of very, we'll say, strong personalities. Um, in some instances where they think that I'm messing with their money, um, and we're talking about rather large sums of money, um, and we, people can get pretty aggressive um, and having to stand my ground. It always rattles me a little bit, um, especially if it gets to the point where I have to involve law enforcement. Um, but I know that I can, and I know that I'm capable. And even though in the moment I get a little shook, I get through it and then I can say, Hey, look at you. You you can you can do this. You can handle it. Yeah, um, I have a therapist too. <laughs> I got the therapy is probably, and I try to tell everyone if you can afford it to try to find it. Um, and that just works in any part of your life. Um, and yeah, I have a really great support system. I think that that when it comes to the other women in this field, the other um people that I can connect with really well that have had similar. Uh, stories and backgrounds and um this sounds ridiculous but I Twitter um just because I've like met so many there that have like when I've talked about my concerns and like my mental health um people have always been like able to 
relate to that and having that re like relationship with um, people online who I've also met with in person at like TWS or any other conference has been a really awesome, really awesome network that kind of creates around the world. Um, and I think that just being just being able to find people that really relate to the things that you go through um, is super important because venting is probably one of the most healthy things that you can do. <laughs> Yeah, all, all my friends hear all the stories, like totally relatable. <laughs> um, this next person asks, what do you do if the authority figures meant to protect you, like the police, rangers, and wardens, are part of the problem? Uh, especially for BIPOC and LGBTQ plus communities, there's a deep history of misuse of power, prejudice, and targeted aggression by law enforcement that is hard to overcome. Uh, this person does not feel comfortable approaching police when their safety is at risk out of fear that they may further endanger them or disrespect their identity. So what advice do you have for building support outside of these traditional legal safety systems? I mean, I guess it kind of goes back to like your professional um network support network that you've identified um because i mean that that is an issue i may not feel comfortable approaching this person at law enforcement or if they're like presenting aggressively towards me um so you have to find that in your own professional settings i guess i would say um and then just i think there's something lee said earlier knowing your escape routes for me Anytime I feel like I'm about to go into a dangerous situation, I feel like I'm all I have. So I'm always identifying the escape routes. Um, and then if you feel like you can't identify that escape route, then you just got to say no. And just don't do it. Yeah, um, it's it's something they teach us in forestry, you know, as an arborist, if you're if you're felling a tree before you make cut number one, make sure you know where the tree is going to go. And if it doesn't go where you want it to go, how are you going to get out from under it? So always know your escape routes. Um, and, you know, it, it sounds terrifying, but we've done active shooter training and things like that. Um, and a whole lot of that sort of terrorist training because we're in public parks, right? Um, we, we, are, we are a potential target. Um, so I'm kind of constantly thinking about what I can hide behind, where <laughs> what I can get under. Um, you know, is this tree thick enough to hide behind? You know, for if if bullets start going, um, if someone is approaching me in an aggressive manner and there's nobody to help, how you know, what's going to be my reaction? I'm I'm thinking more and more about the the pepper spray option now. Um, <laughs> Since you can use that at a distance, although I do keep wasp spray, and I feel like that would probably at least keep someone back for a minute. <laughs> this question is very um, good. I think this is a really good question. I can't really speak very much to it because I have not. I think the closest I've um, come in contact with, you know, police force would be uh, game wardens, and I think that um, because the thing. I just try to make sure that I talk in a way that I talk about myself and then I'm not like projecting anything and trying to keep, even though we're going to have very different views on a lot of the ways that like that we deal with wildlife and that we deal with um, being out into in the environment, um, trying to just find ways to that my communication is nothing that will make them upset in a way. Um, and just laughing at jokes that even if you don't feel funny and I know that's like, is not, the best way to go about stuff, um, but having escape routes. And I uh, really appreciate this question. And I think we do need to talk about it a lot more. Um, and as a white woman, I can't really speak much to, uh, to this. I will say at the end of the day, it sucks. It sucks that we have to feel uncomfortable. It sucks that we have to feel unsafe. It sucks that we even have to have this conversation. Um, and only by having conversations like this can we begin to make things better. So thanks guys at Fielding. Absolutely. Thank you for participating in this.
Um, another, we got about five more minutes. I'm gonna try to squeeze in as many questions as I can here. So the next one is based on your experiences, how can allies better support women and gender minorities doing field work in STEM or in general? Uh, what improvements would you like to see um, in collaboration with allies? Um, so when, when you've identified people that you trust, who, so for like, so they basically are your ally, them going to bat for you when it's critical is just going to be necessary. Um, because as much as we want to have all these solutions and strategies in place, a lot of organizations, they're just not there. They're not well equipped. It's, it's just not happening. And especially at the pace we want it to happen. So I definitely think whoever you identify and you trust, that they definitely have to be willing to go to bat for you and speak up when whatever you're saying is not being heard. That's the only way I feel things can slightly begin to get better for whatever your particular situation is. I, I think that the, the going to bat is 100% the way to support, you know, like, um, and, and then also stepping in when I'm making a stupid decision. I, I don't always make great decisions. Um, and I'll say, oh, no, I'll go to this absolutely remote spot by myself with a chainsaw. It's going to be fine. Um, you know, if, if even if you let me go off and then showing up at the job site and it's like, oh, I was just in the area. I just wanted to make sure you didn't cut your leg off, you know. Um, just having that sort of silent support is is important. Just checking in and, hey, how you do? I hadn't talked to you in a couple of days. You doing all right? That sort of thing. Yeah, I think um, the, especially like the white male uh, superiors that I've had, having them just being able to listen to any concerns that I may have, because I like to talk. So like even just being able to, you know, express my concerns. And even if there's nothing to do, like you can't do anything after once I'm like, like the whole situation situation is over. Um, just being able to hear and be like, okay, I hear you next time. Let's like figure this out better. Let's do this a better way. Um, or, and yeah, the going to bat for you is super important. Having um, those allies as friends is really important. And if they're willing to stand up for you in situations that you can't, that you don't feel like you can stand up for yourself is um, key to try to basically surviving. Absolutely. Um, and I think this is going to end up being our last question. So there are many people who do not see the need for sensitivity training or diversity initiatives that would support women or other marginalized groups in STEM, especially those in government or state universities. Politics and legislative agendas can make things extra difficult especially when it's mostly, like you all said, those older men who are mostly in charge. So how do you counter this mentality um, to give hope for the future? And have you ever had to prove your concerns to people? Um, this is not a good answer, but I feel like I still haven't figured that out. Honestly, just because when you feel like you're making a little bit of progress, there's always something that feels like a setback. So I don't know. I, that's something I'm personally still trying to figure out how to navigate, um, because at the end of the day, that person that's in the position of power, even if you have somebody going to bat for you, it's, I, it's just tough. I think we should start to encourage early retirement. <laughs> no, you're not wrong. <laughs> um, what I am saying, what Abby said about, you know, starting off everybody in, in STEM, in, you know, careers in natural resources in high school. I think that's very important. I am seeing a change. Um, it's slow, <laughs> but it, I am seeing a change. Um, the It's the same problem that we have in politics. We've got a lot of older people with a different viewpoint that are sort of in charge of things where maybe younger people have more progressive ideas, but they simply don't have, 
you know, the tenure to speak. Um, so it, it really is, it's a, it's a matter of time. It's, it's changing too slowly, but it's changing. Um, so yeah, I think the only solution I can think of is just talking to some of these older people that are in charge and being like, man, you know, that boat you were talking about when you retire, like you should go ahead and do that, man. That sounds like a great idea. Just really sell it to them. Um, my is real. Okay. So I think my biggest advice for this, because I think that this is going to be a, we have a long way to go. Um, we have a very, still very, very long way to go in my opinion, just because after working with federal government, um, I've noticed that there's, yeah, we won the early retirement thing because people do stay in their jobs for until they die sometimes. And, um, I think that, uh, we need to, the way that I like to go about things is relating it to their experiences. So being able to take what, like my problems or whatever, being like, okay, but what about this? What if this happened to you? Like, think about it in this perspective. And I've been able to change some minds by going on that, especially when it comes to politics, being like, okay, well, think about it this way. Like, think about your daughter. Think about um, what you would want for your children now in like now 2024. Like, what what would you want to happen with your family, yourself? Um, I've seen that that pretty much works when you kind of relate on level with the person um, that you're talking with, but we still have such a long way to go. Yeah, definitely a long way to go, but hopefully conversations like these can help get that ball moving. And that is our hour. We're all out of time today. So on behalf of Bill Inclusive, I would like to thank you all, Michaela, Lee, and Abby, for joining us today, talking with us, sharing your experiences and advice. Uh, we super appreciate that so much. Uh, we thank you for the work that you are doing and continue to do when it comes to being an inspiration to others in the natural sciences field. And we also thank those of you who joined us today. Um, we will continue these conversations as we further our initiatives and work when it comes to amplifying social field safety issues, as well as amplifying minorities in STEM. So please be sure to follow us and interact with us on all of our social media channels, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at the handle at Build Inclusive. Um, please also be sure to visit our website to learn more about our organization, explore some of our resources and some ways that um, you as an individual or as an organization can support us. Um, tomorrow, be sure to check out the final day of our virtual Build Inclusive week and be sure to follow us on social media for our last giveaway. Tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, we will conclude our Field Inclusive Week by hearing from representatives from the Wildlife Society's Out in the Field organization. Katie O'Donnell, Decision Analyst at Compass Resource Management in Vancouver, and Colleen Altenbuttle, Black Bear and Fur Bearer Biologist for the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, will discuss the topic of field history and LGBTQ plus inclusivity. So thank you all again. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day and look forward to seeing you join us tomorrow. Thank you.